Lord, we know that you have a word for us. Or maybe it's this one, maybe not, Lord. But Lord, we are desperate for a touch from you. Lord, what is the point, Lord, if we were here this whole evening and at the end, Lord, we walk out without a touch from you. Lord, it's all meaningless without you. And I pray that, Lord, we would receive a touch from you today. Lord, yes, we're here to say thank you for your love, but we're also here to say, Lord, we need a touch from you. We need a word from you. So please, Lord, touch us. Holy Spirit, we invite you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus spoke these words um, when he had been hanging on the cross for about six hours. Uh, It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. And shortly after that, he would go on to declare that it was finished and then give up his spirit. Now, this is a word that uh, you can approach from a lot of different theological angles, right? For example, you could talk about uh, why Jesus said, my God, instead of Father. I mean, he started off saying, Father, forgive. And then he would finish saying, Father, into your hands I come in. So why would he say, my God, right? You, you could talk about that. Or you could talk about why uh, Jesus would say, uh, Father, um, you have fors- oh, my God, you have forsaken me. Right? I mean, this is the same Jesus. This is the same Jesus who said uh, in, in John, I and the Father are one. And he also would say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me again in John. So why would he say, For, uh, my God, you have forsaken me? Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, but today, uh, we're not going to talk about any of that. We're going to talk about just one word, just one word in what Jesus just said. It's a word. Why? Have you ever wondered why Jesus phrased this as a question? Was he really looking for an answer? Was he really looking for maybe John to come up and say, no, no, look, Jesus, it's like this. You see, um, you have to bear the sins of the whole world and you have to die on the cross for my sins. And was he, was he really looking for an intellectual answer? I mean, if you read through the Gospels, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. Uh, In uh, John uh, chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus would say, actually, No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Now, this is before Gethsemane even, right? He knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, He would also, uh, the Bible also says, Luke 9, verse 51, that Jesus, when he knew that it was time, he knew that it was time for him to go into heaven, he resolutely said, forth towards Jerusalem, right? Again, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. In the garden, uh, when he was being arrested, he would say, do you not know that the Father will put 10, 12 legions of angels at my disposal uh, if, if, if I called out to him? But I choose not to, right? Again, he knew exactly what he was doing. Probably more than you and I will ever understand, more than anyone in that, in the, in that uh, context could understand, Jesus of all people knew why he was there, why he was feeling forsaken by the I mean, He knew all of that, right? And yet, instead of making it a statement, instead of saying, my God, you have forsaken me, maybe, he chose to make it a question. Now, I may not understand, you know, the full extent of why, uh, you know, Jesus, Jesus uh, you know, posted it as a question, but I'll tell you what, I'm sure glad he did. I'm sure glad you did. You know why? Because there are moments in my life, you know, when I feel everything is gone, when I'm at the lowest point in my life, right? And then I turn around and I say, God, why? Why? Why would you do this? Lord, why would you allow this? Why are you not here? Why cannot, why can't I see you? Lord, why would you answer that? Lord, why won't you answer me? And if you came and came to me with an with an answer with uh, you know with point number one two three that's not what I'm looking for, you know uh, one time I was at a, at a funeral of, of a young girl who had tragically been killed been killed in an accident, and uh, at the end of the funeral I, I came outside and uh, I met one of this girl, girl's closest friends. Now both the girl who, who had died and her friend were both believers, and and I found her friend outside. She was just devastated. By, by what had happened, and uh, she had all these questions about, 
you know, why, why did this happen? And, and she was asking, you know, I don't know where my friend is right now. You know, her body is there, I don't even know where she is. And she had all these questions. And in my immaturity in that moment, I actually went to her and I started talking to her about, well, you know, uh, this is what the Bible says, you know, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord and all of that. You know what her reaction was? She just turned and walked away. You know, all that I said that day was probably true, was probably theologically sound, you know, all of that. But the questions had no answer. The questions was not looking for an answer. Right? She probably knew all the stuff I was sharing too. And so, I'm so grateful that Jesus would have asked this as a question. Because, you know, if you're like me, you know, if your son, your daughter, or if someone else, or sometimes when you yourself have those questions raise up, you know, naturally our inclination is, we're, we're fearful, right? Oh, you know, this, this, this is not good. It's not good. You know, we're supposed to believe, we're supposed to be calm, steady. But then, you know, Jesus is saying, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. You have a God who can handle those moments. You have a God who can handle you when you're so vulnerable and, and, and you have those questions rise up when you're screaming out in pain. You have a God who can handle that. Amen. And he's saying it's okay. He's saying it's okay. My child, it's okay. You know what? He's saying, my child, when you ask me why, guess who's at the other end interceding and mediating? It's the same Jesus who asked, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I love this verse that uh, Pastor Rajan will often quote from Isaiah 42 verse 3. Beautiful verse, which says, Our God, the mighty God who made the heavens and the earth and you know, everything, you know, a bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. That's the God that you and I worship. Amen. Amen. Yes. I just want to leave you with one more thought. So these are questions that don't have answers. But in times like that, I do believe, you know, there's two things the Lord spoke to me and uh, that have really helped me that I want to leave with you. In, in times like that, when I'm asking those questions for which no answer will be sufficient, there's two anchors for me, two anchors. Um, if, you, if you go to Psalm 22, we don't have time, so I won't read from there, but if the Lord is speaking to you right now, I would really encourage you to go back home and read that psalm. Beautiful psalm. David is writing that psalm out of the depth of his own pain and agony. Uh, but the beauty in, in that is, uh, out of his own pain, he's actually writing prophetically also about the sufferings of the Messiah. And so the psalm actually starts, Psalm 22 verse 1, it starts saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus actually quotes from the psalm uh, when he's on the cross. So in that psalm, David will go on from there. He'd say, Lord, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? Lord, I cry out, but you're not listening. Why are you, I am not silent. Why are you silent? And he goes through all of those questions. And then from there, he goes on to describe, you know, all of his pain and his hurt. Lord, my bones, they're dry. My tongue is like, you know, it's sticking to the roof of my mouth. And Lord, they're encircling me like, like bulls. Lord, my closest friend, he's betraying, and, you know, all the pain he's, he's describing. But the amazing thing is, you read through that psalm, by the end of that psalm, David has come to a place of security and peace. You know, the Bible talks of a peace that passes understanding. You can see it in that psalm. Because his situation has not changed. When he starts off saying, why are you forsaken? Same situation is there at the end. But now he's reached a place of security and, and, uh, and peace. And really, there's two things I saw there. And it's two things that have really helped me in my own life, right? The two anchors I told you about in those times. One anchor is to look at what God has done. Who he has been. You see, in that psalm, David would uh, first start off, you know, talking about how God did miracles for the saints of old. He would say, our fathers trusted in you, you delivered them. They cried out to you, they were not put to shame. You know, he'll start like that. Then he starts to make it even more personal. He starts to look at the testimonies of his own life. He says, Lord, you're the one, right? From my mother's womb, you're the one I was cast upon. Lord, you're the one I trusted even on my mother's breast. And he starts to look at what God has done in his life. And for me also, I've reached those points when I told the Lord, Lord, 
I don't understand. I don't like it. I don't see any way through this. But Lord, one thing I cannot deny, Lord, mm. is the cross. I cannot deny the cross. I can never say you don't love me because of my situation. Why? Because you died. I can never say you're not there because of my situation. Why? Because you died. So Lord, yeah, I may I may not understand. I may not get it. But Lord, because of the cross, I know you are there. I know you love me by faith. I know you will get. You are with me. Amen. If you went to the cross for me, how will you not give me everything else? Amen. Yes. Right? So that's the first thing for me. You know, Good Friday. Looking at Good Friday. Looking at the cross. Looking at what God has done. And from there, all of the testimonies in my own life. And then all the testimonies in scripture, the saints of old, and you know how God worked in their life. So that's one anchor for me. Right? And the other anchor is what God will do. What God will do. You see, the present, you know, when it's so rocky and uncertain, right? What God has done, the cross, will not change. And God, what God will do, again, will not change. So two days after. Good Friday, I love it. Easter always comes. Yes. When the night is dark, I love it. The sun always rises. Is there not a pattern for you and for me in those things? You know, is he not saying, my child, though sorrow may last for a night, joy will come. Why? Because the end is certain. So again, in those points when I have hit rock bottom, I've actually said these words, Lord, okay, you know, if I lose everything in this moment, if I die penniless, I still will wake up in your presence. Lord. Okay, Lord, worst case, what will happen? I will starve to death. I will still wake up in your presence. I will reign with you one day. You know, we have such an unshakable hope, okay, that brings us security no matter what our present is. And then I backtrack, I start backtracking from that to say, okay, Lord, not only that, you've also given me promises concerning this life. You've given me promises concerning who I am, concerning what my family will be, concerning what my marriage will be, what my career will be, what my ministry will be. Lord, you have spoken. Your word will not change. That means it doesn't matter what's happening right now. Lord, I know who you've been. I know what you will do. And those are the two anchors. So... You know, you just picture a small boat being tossed by the waves, but if there's these two anchors holding you down, yeah. it's not going to go anywhere. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, because, uh, Lord, we can talk like this just because you paid so great a price. Amen. Lord, we're so grateful to you. Lord, we pray that your word would not go void in our life. In Jesus' name, we pray. Jesus. Amen.